When it comes to prognosticators and prophets and people who are trying to tell you about what's going to happen, we often hear, the end is near. And in my mind, I picture right away uh, somebody walking down the street with a sandwich board and, and on, on them that says, the end is near. Or they'll carry signs. These are modern day prognosticators, some of them. And we have a lot of them out there today. People who are trying to tell us what in our future, what's going to be happening next, what to be ready for. Some of these folks intentionally mislead us too. A lot of this information they have is just blatantly false. It's sensationalism that is set to influence you or to separate you from your money. Today we're going to take a look at another shift of our focus, something that we ought to be doing. How we need to realign our paradigms, how we need to reevaluate where our focus should be. So as we join these two who are on the road to Emmaus and their encounter with Christ, let us today pay attention to where our focus is, to what it is that we're looking at, and what it is we're called to look at. Let us pray. Lord, we pray for your Spirit to rest upon us, filling us, Lord, with your wisdom, with your direction, that we, as those two on the road to Emmaus, would have our eyes opened by your word, that we might see you clearly. And in so doing, we would realign our paradigms and our focuses to be in more in line with what you've called us to be focused on. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So here we are post-crucifixion, the day that Jesus was raised from the dead. And we have these two men walking away from Jerusalem, heading down to Emmaus. They'd heard the news that the women had uh, brought, that, that they had this vision of the angels that said that Jesus wasn't there, that he was risen. They had heard that the other disciples went and found that Jesus wasn't there. They didn't see Jesus, but they found the tomb to be empty. And yet, they were leaving. Now, they weren't part of the, uh, the 12 apostles, the now 11 apostles. They were other disciples. We know that from uh, verse 33. Verse 33 says, In that same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, they, and they found the 11 and their companions together. They weren't part of the remaining apostles, but they were other, they're part of a, another group of, a larger group of disciples that had been gathering. We don't know why they were going to Emmaus, why they were leaving. We can imagine they weren't the only ones, though. I'm sure that given how people act and respond to, to problems, to, uh, to, to crisis, that there was a lot of confusion, a lot of concern about what might be happening to them. So for them to leave doesn't really surprise me. It tells me that they were likely very concerned about their well-being and being in Jerusalem might have drawn too much attention to the group. Jesus was seen as a troublemaker, as somebody who was going to raise up Israel and overthrow the powers that be. And likely anybody with him would also be wrapped into that, into that group. He wasn't alone. They were safer leaving. And as they were leaving, Jesus walked up beside them and walked with them, not revealing himself for who he was, clouding their vision, their eyes and their minds from seeing him. It asks the question, where do we put our focus? Where do we look in our lives and what do we look at? The truth is we get distracted by things that profit us nothing. We get distracted by things in our lives that don't deserve our focus or our attention. We get fixated on the past, and we wonder what might have been, or we wish for whatever was that would come back. Certainly today we're wishing that we were back a year ago when there was no COVID-19, when we were struggling with different issues, but we were at least together. Clearly, the two men that were walking toward Emmaus were sad 
They recognized what they lost. When Jesus asked them, what are they doing? They stopped and stood and they were sad and they said, had you not heard, our leader was killed. They were looking back and fixated on the past, on what was. Sometimes we gaze upon the future and we look toward what is to come and we dream of what might be coming or we dread what might be coming depending upon the day. And I can imagine that those two had great concern about what was coming for them. As they looked at the past, at what had happened, they began to look at the future and began to wonder, were they safe? Where did they need to be to be safe? Perhaps that is why they were making their way out of town. They were beating a hasty retreat. As we get lost in the past or lost in the future, we lose what is right in front of us. Those things that are most important. Nostalgia. We get lost in yesterday and we get lost in what was. This is Modesto, home of graffiti. We, uh, we know about yesterday. We know about the cars of yesterday. We know about the drag, the home of uh, the origination of, of the drag strip, the place where you'd go and you'd get in a line of cars and move at a snail's pace. A route that would normally take you five to ten minutes now takes you two hours. And as you go up and down the road, you talk to the people around you. I know there's a lot of people in our congregation that have fond memories of that time. I started my Marine Corps tour down in Southern California, and when I, uh, on the weekends, we would occasionally head out to Balboa Strip, a little peninsula that would only take us uh, about 15 minutes to go up and back and on a regular day, but on a Friday or Saturday night, it would take us a couple hours to do the loop. And it was so much fun getting to see people, talk to folks, play your music, and kick back and relax. Nostalgia is that being lost in yesterday, and there were some good things about yesterday. But we can get lost in it. We can get stuck in the past. We have all these predictions about the future. What's to come? What's going to happen? When I think about the about people who do predictions, about who, who have these ideas of what's to come, I think a lot about stockbrokers. I heard a story about stockbrokers at one point. I know it's not necessarily true, but it's kind of funny. The stockbroker took a large group of people, cultivated a large group of people, of, of potential clients, and he wrote out to them and he said to one, one set of group, invest your, stock in, invest your money in this stock, and to the other group he said, invest your money in this stock. And one stock took off and one stock failed and he took the people that, that, that won and he took them up again and he broke them into group, two groups. He says, invest your money in this stock and invest your money in this stock. And again, one half of his group uh, had, a, had success and so he took that successful group. And he kept doing it and doing it until he was whittled down to just a handful of people. And no, real, no longer really had a good base of clientele, but he had plenty of money from all the commissions he made. And he was very happy because he won. It seems to me that is the game of prognosticators. They play the odds and then they keep playing. Somebody makes a prediction about what the future is going to hold and sets a date. Here's the date this is going to happen. And then it doesn't happen and that person has to readjust. And we see people throughout history doing that over and over and over again. As people, as the church, we get lost in two worlds. We get lost in the past, and we get lost in the future. And we fail to see what is now, what is here now. And for us to be able to shift, we have to make a conscious effort to make that shift, to focus on the here and the now. But focusing on today is more than just a shift of perspective. It's a shift that we need to make consciously. We need to make this shift and to stop looking behind. Jesus tells us that the person, a person can't put his hand to the plow and look behind him. Luke 9, 62, Jesus says, No one puts the hand to the plow and looks back. It's fit for the kingdom of God. A person who puts his hand to the plow 
gets the, uh, the animal to start moving and looks behind, it's going to have a very curved garden. Looking backwards prevents us from being able to see where we're moving to and where we are right now. We need to stop also putting all of our focus on looking forward, looking to tomorrow. Tomorrow will come. But somehow we have to be able to consciously shift our attention to the here and the now. We have to be aware of the past, we have to be aware of the future, but we need to be aware of what's going on right now. We have been living in a world trying to understand the changes that are going on, not just the COVID-19, but the changes that were taking place even before that, as we were wondering about the church and its future. I heard a lot of people talking about how we live in a post-Christian world, a world that is beyond the church. It used to be Christianity was very influential in America, and we moved away from that. It's no longer as influential. We live in a post-church America. And we're getting kind of lost in this nostalgic look back of what we used to be and how do we get that back. Our conversations have shifted from how do we get this back to we're in waters we don't know, where are we going? The truth is, what we're going through right now is nothing new. We've been going through this cycle since the dawn of time. It's the Judges cycle. In the Old Testament, the book of Judges, we learn that in that time there was no king and the people did what was right in their own eye. And they did evil in the sight of God. When the people would turn away from God, God would turn them over to an oppressor until the people cried out for God to come and redeem them and then God would send a judge, send a Samson or a Delilah, somebody to come and redeem the people and bring them back to God. If the judge was righteous, the people would have 40 years of peace. But if the judge was only half righteous, they'd only get 20 years of peace. Those years judged, the, those years of, of peace are a marker of how righteous the judge was. And the people went through this cycle of returning to God and then falling away from God and returning to God and falling away from God. In America, we've had three great awakenings where the church grew and grew, but that means we also fell away. And then we had the unprecedented revival of the 50s. Four times in our history we've had marked large changes in the size and shape of the church. Today we're back at that downward slump, crying out for God, God, don't forget about us, come back. We're no longer in a post-Christian world. I would suggest we are in a pre-revival world where God comes back and moves in the church. You can call it a pre-Great Awakening world. We're at a point where we're ready for God to come back into the new generation and do a new thing. Now we can get lost in our views behind us and ask, how do we get back what we used to have? We can get lost looking forward and saying, where is God taking us? But the truth is, right here, right now, God is calling us into action, calling us into being. My suggestion is that we stop looking behind, defining ourselves by what we used to be, and we look forward to say, what is God calling us to be here and now? The trouble with looking forward to the prophecies that are what's to come is that none of us really can understand what's before us. You notice with Jesus' life, all of the disciples and all of the uh, people that were following Jesus, none of them understood what Jesus had to go through. They were all greatly confused by his death, even more confused by his resurrection, and he was there. He even told them, gave them spoilers of what was to come, and they didn't get it. Everyone was caught off guard, and Jesus had to come and explain to them the scriptures, opening their hearts and minds to what was promised to the prophecies that were fulfilled in Jesus. If we know that we have troubles understanding what tomorrow could possibly bring, and we know that yesterday is past and gone, and that all we have now is here, in front of us, 
then we know that this is where our focus should be. This is the moment we live in. We don't live in yesterday. We might ruminate on what happened. We might want to learn from our history, but we don't want to get lost in it. We don't want to live in it. And we cannot know what tomorrow is going to bring. We can guess. We can look for those who might have a glimpse into the future. We can look for figures like Nostradamus. I've noticed online there's been a lot of, there's been uptick on, on his predictions. A lot of false stuff going around. The truth is, we've always struggled to understand what any prognosticator has ever said about the future. Truly, those predictions only become clear once that has happened. The truth is, is that prophecy is best understood in hindsight. Prophecy is best understood once it's happened. And we can look back and we can draw the connections throughout history. We can't see the future very well. Yesterday is gone. Tomorrow is unknown. But today is a gift. And that's why we call it the present. We need to treat today as a gift. To live in today. To find our hope for tomorrow. Our lessons from the past. And to realize that the here and now is better than we thought. Even in the midst of this COVID crisis. Could you imagine what life would have been like in 1918 when they were going through the same thing with the Spanish flu? There was no internet. There was no social media. There were no cameras in, in somebody's home sending out the service. Today is a gift despite all of our struggles, to let us treat it like a present, to live in our current reality, giving thanks to God, <coughs> and finding what it is that we've been given in today. It's a conscious shift we have to make. But let us be willing to make that shift this week. Let us pray. Lord, by your gift of presence and word, we learn what we need to to see the world as it is, to embrace God our reality, to shift our focuses, to retrain our hearts and our minds. This week, give us that blessing in abundance to help us to understand that even in this crisis of this pandemic, that the gift of the here and now is something we need to hold on to, to celebrate and to live in in new ways. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ and through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen.